I got this piece of clad made all cut ready to quit. Oh, that's just perfect. Now all I have to do is nail it in. But let's chat about this. I got Rami here from Dow. How are you doing, Rami? Good, Chow. This is a great product, especially on an old building like this when you clad the old sheeting and now giving the extra insulation. Tell me about this Cladmate product. Well, Shell, what we've got right here is a, a Styrofoam Cladmate 1.4 inches, giving you an R, an, uh, R value of 7. So that's an increase of R7 over and above what we've already got on the inside. That's so we're right. going to beef this up to the uh, 21st century insulation on this house. That's right, Shell. There, I mean, what you've got right here is you're really covering all your studs where uh, fiberglass don't cover, and you got to a nice wrap around your house to keep your house pretty warm. Now, what about the ship lap? Is that going to eliminate any reason for paper? Over here, yeah. What you have is all our sheets are have a ship lap uh, treatment, and uh, they're all going to interlock nicely together, and then you don't have any air leakage, so you don't need a, a, a layer of building paper on top of it. So we're going over top with a half-inch plywood, and that's what we're going to use for our siding nail plate. So, uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's going to be as snug as a bug in the rug with this styrofoam product. Oh, I'll just yeah, get this Kyle. up in place here and get her nail in place. I don't need a, uh, a ladder Rami when it comes to putting this product up. Shell, I'll tell you, those people are going to have a comfortable home. Rami, I yeah. want to thank you very, very much for coming out and giving us a story on Styrofoam Cladmate. It's a great product. Thank you very much, Shell. You bet. Well, let's take a look upstairs and just see what's going on with the new addition of the second floor. I'll tell you, this has been a major job. When you start building from the inside out a second floor complete with uh, truss joist system and subfloor and dormers. Just let me explain what we've done here. First of all, we relocated the staircase. And the staircase, now being code, allowed us to put this peninsula here, which is actually covering that or the cap of the closet downstairs, which is quite unique, especially when the interior designers get in here. But also out over the front entrance, it's going to be all open. It's a beautiful area that will give that elevated look looking up into an area where it's all going to be spindled off. And as you can see here, the elevation is, well, it's right at the top of my head. So that's about six foot six. But we're going to make it very livable with eight foot ceilings. Also, we've tied into the roof line now dormers. The dormers are just great. In fact, out here, beautiful view, I might add, which was never there before, because the dormer was never there before. But look at the, uh, the structure here, the two by 10 the rafters now. And the reason why that, in order to compensate for the insulation that's required. But all the roof structure now, all tied back into the original roof line of the front uh, elevation. Now, over here. Oh, hi, Rick. How you doing? Hi, Shell. God, you're really making things happen around here, eh? Yep, we sure now, are. What's, uh, what are you up to here now? What we're going to do here now is tear the other half of the old existing roof off. To put that shed dormer in? Shed dormer up to allow for a lot of headroom throughout the and other I side. I need that headroom, yes. I tell you. Yeah. But 2 by 10 again because two of the 10. insulation requirements. That's right. Uh-huh. There's going to be 2 by 10 rafters all the way along this whole side across on top of this wall that we have out front here. Oh, no. What you've got is the wall already framed. That's right. Ready to stand up as soon as this section of the roof is removed. That's right. Okay. Now, removing the roof, you're going to have to get in there with a the reciprocating saw. That's right. We're going to go right down off the ridge, right down this. This is the outside of the building line here. Right. The other wall will come up here. And then the shed roof will continue from this point all the way through to the other side. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, when it uh, take you a look around up here right now, in fact, you can still see out in over the top of the old uh, front porch there where there's wood chips for, uh, for insulation. There won't be any of that left no. in there, but it's uh, still there from back in the uh, early, well, actually, uh, early 30s. But uh, you got the other end almost, uh, well, finished up to the point that the roof is gone. That's so right. let's go down there and take a look. Okay.
Hey, this is my partner Jay here. He's uh, measuring in some raptors for us. Hey, how are you doing, Jay? Good, yourself? Kind of nice work outside with a beautiful day like this. Oh, it sure is. Super. And then what's he up to? What's he up to? I'm here to pass that down here, Jay. This is what our, our rafter pattern is going to be. All right. Now, this is a 2 by 10 rafter that's going to be coming off of the ridge board. Right. And this is going to be now at a 2 and a half 12 pitch. From an 812. From an 812 pitch to a 2 and a half. Golly, I'll to tell allow you, there's not this. much headroom there, but once that gets up, that's going to give all kinds of headroom, even for me walking around up here. In that's fact, right. It's going to be an eight foot ceiling. Yep. Now, pretty darn close. On the two by ten, right? You've got a two by four strapping here. What's that? All? Oh, ah, for venting. For venting. That's right. To allow for cross ventilation through, uh, for the air to circulate around the two by ten, so it doesn't dry or anything. Right. And the structure board on top. That's to get our proper height for the exact ridge, and then this will all get sheeted. And then there's a rubber torch on membrane that will go on top of the sheeting. Because of the two and a half pitch. Because it's such a low pitch roof, right? Great. Now, once that's all in place, and I'll give you that back there, Jay, you're just trying to get your, uh, your levels, I assume, are you? Yeah. Great. Okay. And that's going to be coming out to the outside wall. That's right. Sit on this wall. And there'll be lots of room all the way down this whole entire Boy, side. Boy, what a change, eh? Because oh. we're going to have a walk-in closet, a bedroom where I'm standing here now, a bedroom out into the front with a dormer that comes on into the bathroom. That's it's just right. going to be absolutely great. Yeah. Now, I Great's guess uh, you fellows, Miles, will continue on, get the other half of that roof off, and then I'll come back and give you a hand, and we'll swing this wall up, because I can't wait to see the change in uh, definition of as far as wall structure and the roof structure coming right. into it. Be Great. able to tell a whole bunch of Well, I'll let you get at it. Well, thank you. All right. All right. Back to you. All right, Nailer. Good. Good man. Good. Wow, I tell you. Yeah, it's going to look hey, great. Hey, we go into this business doing this, uh, taking the older homes and making them new again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Rick, let's get this one up in place. Well, we... I got this end okay, yep. Got her. I like it. I tell you, we got uh, six up and only another 14 to go, Rick. We'll be able to put that plywood on top and get that uh, torch down roof on. And hey, we're dry inside again. And with the look of this weather, it's going to be absolutely great tomorrow. So we'll get it finished up. But you know, it's amazing what it does to this area. It's just absolutely great. Look at the old roof line there, the way it tapers down, giving an 8-12 pitch. Now with this two and a half pitch coming into play, it gives so much more room up here. You know, what a way to finish an old house. Hey, Corey, you got lots of electricians upstairs there today, and you're down here working on the main panel. Yes, Shell, we're just installing the main electrical panel in the house here. You know, there's quite a difference, isn't it, from the old farmhouse uh, compared to today's. Mind you, we've taken this old house and completely yeah. stripped it, so it's really right. new construction again. Yes. But uh, some of the old houses that uh, you obviously get involved in when they're being restored or additions going on them, Tell me, uh, how do you get wires into them? Well, in the old days, uh, there wasn't very many outlets in the house. With maybe one switch and one plug. And, uh, in fact, you can pull chains. That's right, that's yeah. right. So we'll have to fish from either from a crawl space or from an attic. And sometimes it's difficult, depending on the framing. Now, what happens in the older homes where there was no ground uh, plug required, or at least there was, they were grounded back to the old steel pipes and whatever. There's only two-pronged plugs. Uh, when you're obviously putting in new uh, circuits, you, you use the three prongs. That's all that's available, so you have to put that on. Now, do you run back right to the panel of the ground then? Or? If you can, if there's accessibility to it, but most times you can't. You just got to put the new device on because the old one is worn out and doesn't work any longer. So therefore, you just put it back and replace yeah. it the way it was. Yes. Now, getting into a 100 amp uh, service here in this uh, uh, reconstruction of this home, Yes. What would be the comparable side back in uh, 1929 when this place was originally built? I would probably have would have had a 30, 30 amp single phase service wow. uh, back then, and now uh, 100 amps is minimum. That's, That's your minimum size service for Now, going to 100 amps, uh, is there enough power there for everything, including accessory items? Sorry, for example, a hot tub. This home is going to have a hot tub. Yes, for this house, it's fine. Uh, there's no uh, secondary suite. 
it's uh, basically a single family dwelling and it'll be ample power. So there is sizing involved when yes. it comes to sizing a panel. Yes. Yes. Now, if you were to put in a 200 amp service in a home of this size, I've had a lot of people call yeah. me up and say, Shell, we're doing some restoration on our home. Uh, should we put in a 200 amp? And I always say, well, yeah. no, you don't need it really unless you're going to be... In like, a lot of cases, if you don't have electric heat, it's overkill. It's overkill. Yes. Now, electrical panels, where they're located, I know a lot of homeowners say, why did they put the electric panel there? I mean, why didn't they put it somewhere where it's convenient? Well, uh, we're limited to where we can extend the uh, panel from the main meter base. From the main yeah. meter base from outside. Yes. So therefore, if it comes in overhead or comes underground, from that point to the... Yes. Uh, now, is that all uh, controlled by the code in the local area? Uh, it's uh, yes, it is. It is. So, and but as far as the wiring itself coming into that, if they wanted it somewhere else, what would be the requirements? So if I wanted to say over in the laundry room. Okay. Uh, like in this case, you'd have to have a disconnect switch here, and then you could extend it anywhere you like in the house, or you could embed embed the tech cable in concrete, two inches of concrete. And Ooh, then that you sounds expensive. So yes. that's, that's well, where the costs come in then. It is at this stage of the game. Yes. Right. Yeah. Now, wiring, I mean, when you see the wiring coming into the, uh, the main service panel here, it's like spaghetti, it's coming from all over the place. Now, I know the electricians upstairs are feeding it all down here to you, and you're yeah. going to be working in the box. Mm -hmm. How the heck do you tell what's what? Well, we, uh, we uh, identify a few cables, uh, just that we want to hot up for construction, but most of it is we just identify it on the finish when everything's hooked up. And uh, is that where I see you with the walkie-talkies? Yes, that's right. And Correct. that way you power one up, and then you can tell... Exactly. We turn it off, and then we label it. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. Now, electricians today do a lot more than just electrical wiring. Yes, we do. We do, uh, we do data cabling, we do uh, intercom systems, we do vacuum systems, we do uh, some remote control lighting switches. So anything that goes yeah. in the walls that has electronics attached to it or associated with it, you people can do it. Yes, we can. Now, I've got to ask this question. In these older homes where they don't tear them apart, they may have plaster, yes. lath and plaster, uh, how on earth do you ever fish a line in? Uh, we can do it, sometimes with damage, most times without, uh, depending if there's a crawl space or an attic. Uh, so it's just accessibility. So you can come down through yes. a wall or up through uh, from a sure. floor cavity, yes. depending if it's... Inside of a closet where you might not see any exposed wire, we may go in there. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to this. You did a great job. And, uh... Well, let's go down into the basement and see how they're making out with the heating system because I saw the furnace come in today and I see Jim's here from Solis Energy Center. Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Hey, Shell. Great, nice, nice to, see to see you. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, this is a lot smaller than the furnace that come out of that old barn. Yeah, people used to oversize their furnaces quite a lot. Well, back in the 30s, I'm sure they were very much oversized because it was humongous. But tell me about these new high-efficiency furnaces. Well, this is a Bryant multi-stage, uh, state-of-the-art furnace gas gas fired it's uh all the bells and whistles all the bells and whistles it's got electronic ignition instead of the typical old pilot light on the furnaces uh, the air is supplied uh, to the furnace through the return air ductwork and that'll be coming down That's from coming upstairs down here and on into the uh, air filter this is quite an interesting air filter now what's this all about that's a uh, April Air high efficiency pleated air filter. Wow, it's got the, uh, the media is quite uh, quite uh, thick here, and uh, the, uh, takes away most of the pollens that are, you know, usually in in the house. What sort of efficiency are we talking about? About 95 percent. 95 percent. Far cry over those little one inch units that don't stop anything but gun wrappers, eh? That's right. But once the air comes into the furnace, then what happens? Well, it goes through the heat exchanger gets heated up from the heat exchanger and supplied through all the various areas of the house through the floor register. There's no pilot light. That's right. It's electronic ignition. Electronic. Now, yeah. obviously, that's going to save energy. That is. You don't have that pilot light uh, burning constantly. But uh, what the sequence would happen is the uh, furnace would get a call for heat from the thermostat. Right. Uh, the uh, the electronic ignition would spark, right. light the gas. Right. The burner would shoot the flames into the heat exchanger and the air would blow by 
and to be supplied to the house. Distributed on through the house. Through the house. Now yeah. I understand that this unit here has a variable speed motor as well. That's right. That's got to be quiet. Well, it is. It's it's quite a quiet uh, furnace running on its low speed, and uh, typically most homes can just be heated from the low fire, which is where you're really saving your money. So that's the low fire of the two stage. That's right. Okay, and then if there is a, a real demand, say for example, a very cold night, a cold windy night, then that is what's going to get the efficiency up by going to the second stage, which is a higher? That's right. If the furnace can't satisfy the dwelling uh, heat loss within about 15 minutes, it will jump into the high fire, shoot more gas in, and you get more, more uh, heat out of the furnace, and uh -huh. the fan speed goes up to take the heat across the heat exchanger, Right. and then you snap, you got your, uh, you your house your... up the temperature. Now, you mentioned something there, heat loss. What's that all about? Well, that's every building has a heat load, and that's what determines the size of the furnace going in. Yeah. Now, we put a whole new basement underneath the old Rankin Farm home here, so therefore we've got more area. We're going to have higher efficiency windows. We're going to have more windows, because now we've got dormers installed at the upper level. So does that all affect the uh, heat load? Oh, definitely. Yes, everything is put into a calculation. Uh, the type of windows, the R value of all the walls, the R value of the ceilings, the floor. Right. Everything has a value. And that's all input into the calculation. So therefore, that, what you're saying, if I was renovating an old home and I was going to be putting a new furnace in it, there would be no way would I ever just take uh, an old furnace out and put a new one in, take it into consideration, well, it's big enough or it's, uh, uh, it's reduced by the efficiency level. It has to be calculated as far as a heat load to the heat loss. That's right. Wow, every, I wonder if building, a lot of people do that today. Well, it's uh, something that's uh, very important for the uh, proper operation of the furnace, right. for the life of the furnace. What and, about the ducting? Well, the ducting is derived through that heat loss, actually. The amount of heat required is defined in every room. And then the duct sizing to get that correct amount of heat into that room would be determined from the heat load. Can you see this home being a bit of a challenge? It is because most renovations are uh, typically they've been renoed a couple of two or three different times over the last few years. Right. And uh, it's tough to get uh, some of the ductwork around, but uh, there's always a way. And uh, to the top floor is quite important. The top floors are you know notorious for being a little cool. And you got to be return air from the top you floor wanna, and also from the main floor. You want to get your return from the same areas as you're supplying. You want to try and get the whole house ventilating. Right. Do you want like everything you want, moving, you want, everything you want circulating? Air movement circulating, and uh, you want to supply everywhere. If you can. So it's very important duct uh, technology that uh, you can have a very efficient furnace, but if you don't have the proper duct sizing and also the proper location of the ducting for return air to come back on a free flow, uh, my knowledge is uh, over the years is presented that uh, if you don't have it, you just don't get the energy that you want, heat energy that is, to those faraway places. That's correct. There are a lot of uh, furnace systems that aren't necessarily designed with those things in mind. So therefore, and taking an old as efficiently. Of course. Yeah, if we're taking an old home, for example, that uh, you may need some duct design changes if you're to put on a new furnace. Well, you have to actually see what kind of duct is in the home to begin with. Right. And then you'd want to see if the furnace you're you're putting in needs to perhaps have more air uh, air supply coming out for the furnace, for the heat exchanger, because you want to make sure that you've got the right amount of air going across the heat exchanger for the life of the heat exchanger. Right. Well, so, I'll tell you, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. By the time we get the ducting in and get it all uh, set up in operation in this home, I can't wait to see this whole unit in operation because, hey, it's going to be a lot warmer in here than what it is right now. And it's a very active building here today. we get all kinds of trades on board. So uh, I'm going to take a look and see what's going on in other areas. Thanks very much, and I'll let you get at it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Now when the restoration program is at this stage, when it's all rough in construction, now is the time to get anything upstairs that's really heavy. And we happen to have something that's really heavy. It happens to be the old bathtub that came out of the home. It used to be on the main floor, but now it's going up into the new, well, up into the second level. Here, let me give you a hand there, Phil. And as you can see here now, if the railings were already in place, it just would have been impossible to get around this corner. You got it? Okay.
guy in the tub, folks. Look at this. No, I'm not having a bath, but I'll tell you, I had to get in just to see how I fitted in this old cast iron tub. That was one heck of a job getting this upstairs because they're heavy. They weigh over 200 pounds. And the guy that really put the finish together is David here. And David's from Integrity Kitchen and Bathroom Resurfacing. David's great company. Tell me, how do you go about doing this? Do you have to sandblast the old finish off or what? Well, this tub here, Shell, this is a, this is a typical five-foot cast iron tub. And we took it from the old house and we took it out to a sandblast pit. And the first thing we did was remove all of the lead-based paint off the outside. Oh, so that's environmentally friendly. Definitely. Got we it all done now. Lead is a concern now, especially for young families. You bet. So we want to remove the, the lead-based paint from the outside. Then the inside, we patched and did any repairs we needed to do on it. Right. Then we applied a, a special coating on here, which is designed for this industry, Epicoat, uh -huh. by Integrity Coatings. Um, put a primer base on there. Right. Top coat. This should last at least 15 years. Wow. I'll tell you, and I see you did uh, the old kitchen sink and the drain board. In fact, uh, that we're going to put that in the laundry room on a cabinet in the laundry room so to bring back that old uh, authentic uh, feeling when you're in the laundry room. But you know, you do a lot of things. Obviously, you don't just do the old uh, tubs of the 30s, but you also do new tubs that uh, people want to change colors. What's the choice of colors? Any, it's endless shell. Basically, the whites, this here is an off white. There's about 155 shades of white in the pottery. Well, business. I can see so, that know. here. In fact, this is a different white here on this other cloth. In fact, you have chrome. That would really add uh, some change to a decor. Depending how what fixtures we put on here, you can have chrome, brushed nickel. You can go white. You can do any color you want. Some people do a dark, like a dark green, a hundred yeah. green on the outside for contrast. Excellent. And I see now in your hand there, you've got some other interesting pieces there, ceramic tile. So you do ceramic tiles as well? Yes. All right. Now, let's see what you got here. you got a whole bunch of goodies here. Now, ceramic tile, obviously, if you have a, a pattern that's a little outdated, so yes. you can... Uh, just do the tile, whatever color you want, get rid of those uh, patterns? Exactly. And, and what happens is the grout lines are then filled in. It's a nice sealed surface, Whoa. easier to clean. No more grout problems. Hotel housekeepers love us, show. I bet you they do. Now, also, I see that uh, tiles here have got a, a little different texture on them. And it's got uh, almost like a uh, what we used to call the Roxitone. Yes. This is a textured surface. We use this for countertops. A lot of times uh, we had ceramic tile countertops yeah. in old kitchens. And this is just one of the effects that we can we can do to... Interesting. And as far as colors of tile, any color whatsoever. I mean, there's a quite a variety there, but you say any color whatsoever. Yes. Now, here is a tile here that's a non-slip. So obviously, could you put a non-slip in the bottom of this tub? Definitely. If we're going to put a sunflower, uh, a riser tube with a sunflower shower head, this is going to be used for showering. You know, with the old-fashioned curtains. Oh, yeah, right. Definitely, we would recommend a non-slip surface in the tub so you don't take a spill. Well, that's great. I'll tell you, I'll just give those back to you for me to get out of this tub. But you know, when you see this tub already, it makes this room look good. And it's still in the rough stage. The windows are not even in yet. But uh, I can tell you, I can't wait to see this finished. And uh, well, maybe they'll even let me take the first bath in here. And Mind you, a little bigger tub for you. A so. little bigger tub. Five foot's not quite long enough for that five foot 18 body of mine. I've got a nice six footer for you. Oh, great. Thanks very much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Great job. You're welcome.